trades back at you Tuesday, 2 p.m. Tuesday, 2 p.m. It's on podcast on iPhone. If you have an iPhone, you can download it. Episode 3, 3, my main man, Steven, is the man. He's the foundation. He's like the floor of a house. He's like the concrete. He's You build a house on top of concrete. You have like church, religion, money, or something. Wait a minute. I, I heard that. I'm, that's coming out wrong, but he's like the... He's like the foundation. Good day, Stephen. How are you? I'm great. I'm great, Jeff. How you doing? Good to see you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for coming on such short notice. Um, I had some other people, but we, you roll with the punches. You roll with the punches. So I know I can always rely on you. Just like uh, with lending, uh, you're the man. You're the man with the plan. And I said, Stephen, what can we do today? What can we do today? And you came up with a, uh, a great topic that I couldn't say no to leadership. Leadership is something I learned at a very young age. And when I think of that, it brings back a lot of memories of me being a helper. I guess jumping right into it. Today's show is about leadership. I apologize we didn't advertise anything about it. That's a big, big like word and term is leadership. And it brings back a lot of memories we'll go into a little bit later of me being a helper, which I was in a lot of different situations, when before I was 18, 15, 16, 17, 18, of uh, these companies, I was like the do boy, but I worked directly with the owner, uh, which everybody kind of got jealous, which is a weird thing. But I did all of his stuff that he couldn't do or didn't have time to do. So just a little bit about leadership in life, we have either leaders, we have either leaders or we our followers, which there's nothing wrong, uh, no matter if you're a leader or a follower, but we are always dealing with one of the other. Uh, to the topic of the day, uh, dealing with one of the other topic of the day is leaders, leadership. Uh, what is and how I can become one, uh, and how can I become a better leader or a better follower? And I think if you can stick to the persistence of becoming a better follower. You are a leader, and I think a true leader is never pointed, you know, you don't call yourself a leader. Um, if you don't know who Tim Grover is, highly recommend reading his book, Relentless. Um, I don't know if I have it here. It might be behind me. This book is called Relentless. Oh, my gosh. He's, it's called Cleaner, uh, a Cleaner. Um, I can't remember it. I can't remember all the ones, but it's like Cleaner finisher or something but he's a leader and he says a leader never calls himself a leader others do others do so steven uh it's good seeing you uh you're going to talk to us about some of this you mentioned that you were going to school or took something in school or studying leadership in school and your background is in leadership and you feel you have that foundation to talk about leadership absolutely enough of me rambling let me know how like how good you feel like you're confident in taking on this leadership topic today what absolutely. what's going on there absolutely yeah no thank you i appreciate the opportunity to be a part of the podcast again and, and also talk about this uh topic i'm very very passionate about have been very passionate about leadership for a long time so i got my first job um uh, in college as a supervisor and i think i failed miserably uh, because I didn't really know, I, I just was the boss, right? So I figured my job was just to boss people around. I didn't know there was more to uh, to That's leadership. Than leader. The boss. That's a good, a good leader bosses people around <laughs> relentlessly all day. Right. right now right. they don't do what the guy says, but they get bossed around. Absolutely, absolutely. I figured that's that's all that was involved is just boss people around, tell them what to do, but. Um, but you know, I, I've had the pleasure of working with some really good people who have been both extremely good, uh, leaders and followers. And, um, you know, it's been well over, you know, 20 plus years in leadership capacity. And, um, also, you know, I've, I've been a professor at, uh, Baker University as an adjunct professor for uh, 16 years. Yeah. For the last 16 years, I've been an adjunct professor. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Wait a minute. Okay. So two things. You're going so fast. Hold on. You were a supervisor at the college, 
and no, you were a teacher. Supervisor. My first my first leadership position was a supervisor at, at a <laughs> at where? At a mall. Mall. I was, I was were, at you a mall. A mall cop? were you a mall? Cop? You're a mall cop. I could see you being a mall cop. <laughs> no, I was, I was, the, the thing that they beat people with and a taser. <laughs> I wish. I when, wish. I didn't have that much fun. When you were a supervisor in the mall, where uh, can you say where you worked or what you did? Like where you? Yeah. Worked? Absolutely. I worked at Sir Knight Formal Wear. Sir Knight Formal Wear. It was a tuxedo, it was a tuxedo rental spot in the Oak Park Mall in Overland Park, Kansas. That was my first gig. How old were you? I was 17. It was just, just out of They gave you a, what did you do? Who did you convince? Man, did they not think, did you look like you're 25 when you were 17? No, I just think that uh, they didn't have any other options and I just happened to walk in at the right time. <laughs> trying to put men's warehouse out of business. Like, <laughs> like we need a supervisor. This guy yeah. looks great. Uh, yeah. Men's warehouse out of business, which I love. Men's warehouse. This is <laughs> men's warehouse. This is men's warehouse. So I uh, love. Uh, I got a couple guys there that I go and they do everything. That's those are leaders because I don't do anything and they pick everything out. So, <laughs> I thought you have to be eighteen to work. Well, no, no. I guess you have to be sixteen to work. Yeah, sixteen. Yeah. 18, yeah. So it's a t it's a tuxedo rental spot, so they want alcohol there. No alcohol. No, no alcohol. No, no alcohol. Just neckties. Just neckties. Just neckties. <laughs> How long did you work there? I was there for about a year uh, as a supervisor, and, and then went over to another mall spot as a supervisor again, and um, all while I was going to college. And what did you uh, supervise? You supervise the the system well, helping the people try and close. Yeah, the tuxedo place. I help. Uh, I supervise. The, we have a couple of people that worked for me, and um, you know, early shift, late shift, so on and so forth. And I uh, supervise them, and um, you know, they just make sure they understood how to how to take the measurements, place the order, stuff like that. Did they get paid commission? Was it a commission incentive job? No, it was an hourly position. Oh. It was hourly, so they weren't extremely okay. motivated to do it to do a great job. So you it took exceptional hour. leadership to get them to. Uh, you had hourly. And you had to tell them yeah. what to do, so that's probably why they didn't listen because there was no extra incentive. And then, right. did you did they poke people all the time with those little needles that they pin your clothes? Yeah. With? Did you have yeah, like, a three strike rule? If you poke three people, you're done. You're like you can't yeah, go more than three people, or you're fired. That was the fun part about it. You could fire them. You're out of here. You're out of here. <laughs> Nine. Okay, that. Yeah. You went so fast over that. I was really curious. Um, I had yeah. more. Yeah, now, no, no worries. Uh, what go ahead. did you? Um, they and then they allowed you to teach people. They, what did you? You taught college students. Yeah, so I, I went to. Uh, I got my. I have two master's degree and a bachelor's degree and a couple classes from a PhD. So when I finished my second master's, um, I started. Uh, I went back to the schools that I had gotten my degrees from and asked them if I could teach. And they allowed me to come in and teach on marketing and management and leadership and things of that nature. Uh, both DeVry as well as uh, Baker University and, and a couple other institutions um, where I've taught it over the years. And so uh, when I decided to go get my Ph.D., which I haven't finished yet, um, a couple classes away from that. But when I decided to go get my Ph.D., I decided to make it the emphasis in leadership and organizational culture, because leadership is something I've always been very interested in. Um, how do we get people to do what they're supposed to do when sometimes they don't want to do it, right? So that's always been a topic that's been very interesting to me. So I, I decided to study leadership for my PhD topic. I think what a lot of leaders misunderstand, what a lot of leaders misunderstand, and in that statement that you're saying, how to get others to do things that they don't want to do, how to get others to do things that they don't want to do. And I think the best leaders that I've learned from, and something that somebody said to me, something that someone said to me, I was 17, um, going to school full time. Uh, I think I was going to um, SEC Adult High School or something, working full time. I can't remember, but I worked on the weekends and then someone during the week and I worked for this AC company. Well, they did commercial they did all the, that's when Super Walmart started becoming big and they had the refrigerators and the Walmarts and they were turning all the Walmarts into Super Walmarts. He did all the refrigeration lines and all of them all over the country. I didn't go over the country, thank I mean, all over Florida or whatever. I didn't have to go everywhere, but I was his new boy. And um, he would ask me to do, and this he's not the only one that said this, but he would ask me to do things and others might say, that's beneath me, that's beneath me. 
And I think I, I learned at a young age that this trait is something that every leader, a good leader has. And I wanted to, and some of the things I would, he would want me to do. I can't remember whether it's change oil in the trucks, wash the trucks, scrape the, the uh, rubber hose off the copper, which really sucks. And it hurt. It's, it's really bad. I don't know if it's bad for hand, but it sucks. Um, and, um, God, I can't, I'm trying to think of the worst job, but he said, Jeff, he said, Jeff, you, you're giving me an attitude. And I said, no, I'm not giving you an attitude. You're on your third glass of Captain Morgan and ice water. Um, I was joking with him, but he was on his third cup. Anyway, so he said, Jeff, everything that I'm asking you to do and everything I ask every other person in this company to do, I have done tenfold. There's not one request. There's not one item. There's not one chore. There's not one job, whether it's cleaning the toys, which I hate. Everybody always says that, but I didn't think of anything. I couldn't think of anything to say. The worst job you can think of, I've done it. And if I can do it, and I'm doing it, and it's not beneath me, it's not beneath you. And it stuck with me. It stuck with me because there's a lot of jobs that you get asked to do, and you think you're better than it. You think you're better than it. And a lot of people play that role, and they're like, I'm not doing that. That's not my job. I'm not I'm not going to I'm not gonna go um, call these people or pick up this trash, or I'm not going to go take the trash out, or help others if they drop something or I don't know. Uh, I can't think of a good one off the top of my head, but that, right. that stuck right. with me. You're right. If you think about it, you know, some of the best, the best way to learn how to lead is to learn how to follow. Um, there's a lot that we learn when we are following, we're listening, we're learning, we're observing. And then we then in turn can um, emulate or model the same good behavior that we learn from being good followers. So, you know, the best way to become a good leader is to be a good follower, right? Um, there is so much that there's so much to be learned in being a good follower. Go ahead, sorry. I remembered what he said to me that I gave him an attitude. Yeah. He lived in Lake Helen. Um, uh, great company, nothing bad. Hopefully he doesn't come on and I'm sure he's never going to hear this. But he lived in Lake Helen and he lived off this dirt road and he had a couple acres. And I had to go dig holes for the fence uh, to finish the fence. And it was only me, just me. And these posts aren't your normal fence posts. They're like tree trunk things uh, that he was using. And it took me, I don't know, like two weeks. I thought I was going to die. Um, and I, I was like, this is nuts, man. You can, I, I'm, I'm going to die out here because I was by myself. Uh, uh, but he's like, look, I've done, you know, whether it's at home or it's at work. And I think when you try to get others to do things that uh, you want them to do, if you can do those things for them and get it started and make it seem easy and make it seem that this you have confidence, this is a good thing, you're helping others do this thing, I think they will fall in line. It's when leaders don't do it and it never gets done. It never gets done. It never gets done. It never gets done. And they're like, well, you didn't do it. You didn't do it. Or, you know, they try to skip around it. If you step in and start doing it and, and say, I'm going to, I did it, I'm going to do it, and then I'm going to do it again. And then if they don't follow, then, hey, you're out of here. But normally someone's going to say, hey, look, he's doing it. It's not beneath him. I'm going to do it too. Yeah, and you think about it, the the purpose and the objective of leadership is is to get things done through people, right? That Sometimes that requires you to do it yourself. Sometimes that requires you to get other people to do it. But ultimately the objective is, as a leader, is you're supposed to develop that person to learn how to do the job themselves. So if that involves me first starting off by showing them uh, and then secondarily allowing them to do it and then me observing and coaching them and giving feedback along the way to make sure that they understand how it gets done. Because when, when you have any job that needs to get done, you have two components that you have to take into account. The first is, does the person have the commitment to do it, right? Are they committed? Are they enthusiastic? Do they have the enthusiasm, the commitment to do it? And the second aspect is, is do they have the competency, right? Do they understand? Do they have the education? So you have commitment and you have competency. And that's the two factors as a leader that we have to assess. We have to be able to assess that person's ability to be able to do a task that I need them to do based on their commitment and their competency. If they don't have the competency, then as a leader, I need to teach them how to do it, right? Because that's all competency is, right? If they don't have the commitment, then my job as a leader is to try to figure out what's causing them to waver from a commitment standpoint. Is it, are they disillusioned? Are they a disillusioned learner? 
right? What is, what's yeah. causing something going on at home? What's causing them to have a wavering of their commitment level to that particular task? So our job as leaders is to be able to understand, first of all, what is it that has to get done? And does the person have the commitment and the competency to be able to get the task done? If not, we have some work to do. That's kind of where we start with. I think a lot is fear. Or yeah. Fear. And it's either childhood or what are you drinking? Is that like a bottle of like moonshine? This is this is tea, you know, this is self filter uh, tea. <laughs> it's like a glass jug that you put jelly in. Mm-hmm. Um, loose tea, loose tea. It looks like there's stuff what is that? Is that stuff like swimming in there? It's loose leaf tea. It's like green tea. Oh, you're going healthy on me. You're going oh man. Okay. Okay. Um I don't even know what to say with that. We'll get we'll talk about that later. Right. Um, but man, I lost my train of thought there. So that's all right. That's all right. What does uh, what does leadership mean to you? Which I think you kind of answered that. I did. I and, did. And you were breaking down what defies a good leader. You yeah. What defies a good leader. And I think I think one of the hardest things for leaders to do is let other people. I think that's a issue with leaders like what's a good leader and what are the issues being a good leader is letting other people do things and not micromanaging right. not just doing everything because you want it done your way and the right way but yeah. learning that if you can have someone else do these things especially if you're paying them you can do more things that you can focus on that's right yeah that, that one of the greatest deficiencies that is found in leaders or what you exactly what you just said, the micromanagement, uh, the hovering, uh, you know, the the fear that a person is not going to be able to do it. And those are some of the biggest demotivators or hinders of comp of commitment. Remember, I talked about commitment, right? Competency versus commitment. Well, guess what? You can kill someone's commitment to a job or a task simply by micromanaging them, hovering over them and not letting them do their job. Right. Think about how some of the bosses that you've had that have done that. And you thought, well, well, I really know how to do this. Why are you all over me? Let me do my job. Well, that is a that is a killer of, of commitment right there. Those are some of the things that kill people's commitment to the job is because they're being micromanaged or overmanaged from their boss. Or the boss is being rude or cusses at them or yells at them. And there's a lot of jobs that people just can't do anything about it. And it destroys, you know, um, I'm not going to get in crazy details, but you know, um, with one of my jobs, I'll just say that I had someone like that. And it, 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 just, it, it bothered me more than I knew it because it was coming out at home. It was coming out when I wasn't working. You can't get away from it if you have somebody that just doesn't know how to lead uh, correctly by any means. So when you have, so Jeff, when you have, when you talk about leadership, you know, one of the topics that's, that's out there in the, in the arena, the academic arena is leadership styles. Like what is your leadership style? What is my leadership yep. style? Yep. And so it's real important as, as a leader and also a follower, it's important for me to know how do I like to be led? Okay. And it's important for the leader to know how do they like to lead? But guess what? Those two don't often match up, right? Uh, how I like to be led doesn't always match up with how you're comfortable leading me. Yeah. You may have a comfort zone of how you lead. You may have a very autocratic style, and I have, may have a completely different way of that I like to be led. So that is where you have a miss. You have a miss, if you will, in terms of the leadership relationship between a leader and a follower, because that leader says, well, this is the way I do things. And the follower goes, well, well, I really need this type of leadership style. And there you have a mismatch. And there's where a lot of the issues occur between leadership, between a follower and, and, and a leader, too, as well. I always think that you get more bees with honey. Yes. You get yes. more bees with honey. I've yes. been and I've had a lot of jobs, um, probably more than you, I would think, um, too many jobs to list, whether it's construction, sales, telemarketing. I had a telemarketing job once when I was younger, and I don't know if you ever seen the movie Boiler Room. It's yes, I did. Ben Affleck and a couple other people. And oh, yeah. he's in there, and the dude gets a job at that firm, which is like, I think, ripping people off. And he's like, I want you to go buy a new car. I want you to go max out your credit card debt or your credit cards. 
this appointment setting telemarketing, which my claim nickname was telemarketing, I did very well, I made a lot of money. Um, this one, I, don't, I didn't stay there, I was there maybe a week and two, and I realized it was BS. But he did that same speech to everybody when he started, when they, they he just opened it, started it, and I'm like, I'm looking, and I look at the guy next to me, and I'm like, you know where he got that, that's boiler. <laughs> and the dude's like, I think you're right. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be bad. This is going to be bad. <laughs> uh, but he, but he, what he did is he got everybody in the mindset to uh, really let loose and get over the fears. I think you're, when you're going back to leadership styles, whether it's in a department store or sales or face-to-face -face sales or over the phone sales, you know, the you have to be a different type of leader because you have to find out what the person's weakness is. I think that's a hard thing. And what you're saying is coaching them through the weakness. Some of the best leaders I have and had are the ones that figured that out, that figured out, hey, this is a weakness uh, to help with it, but also um, be there to get through it. I did better when I had a lifeline that could help me close the deal on every deal than I did having a lifeline that didn't know how to close the deal or would rather walk away from the deal instead of close the deal. When you're in sales, you are you don't make any money unless you have a sale. And I think that, that there's, you know, that leadership role, um, whether, depending what you are, but that you get more bees with honey. There's a lot of leaders out there that just destroy, I hear it where I go places, and I think they're just acting out of hurts. So that style, what, what is that style called? The wrong way? Yeah, that's called the wrong way. You know, there's there's uh, so a quick synopsis. So there's there's Ken Blanchard, who a lot of people may be familiar with. Ken, Ken Blanchard's uh, the one minute manager. Uh, but also, yeah, but he also wrote a book called Situational Leadership, and his theory of leadership is situational, right? And so there's four leadership styles. The four leadership styles are at the lower levels. Uh, directive, right? So you think about it as if you're going into the military, you know, in the military, they direct you. They tell you when to eat, where to eat, when to take a shower, right? Everything is directive. It's one way from the leader to the follower. And then you've got the second leadership style, which is coaching, right? Think about it as, as if you are coaching your kids or coaching other kids. It's, it's okay. Hey, this is how I want you to done. I want it done. I need to observe you. I need to correct and give you feedback, right? That's the coaching leadership style. Then you got supportive, right? Is the third leadership style. Supportive is more where the person has demonstrated an ability to do some of the things that the, the right way. So you start backing off a little bit from, you know, from that, that heavy directive leadership style and letting them kind of start driving a little bit. And then you have more of the delegating leadership style, which is the fourth leadership style. And delegating is not dumping and walking away. Delegating is, is you've already seen that this person knows how to do the job, right? So now you can let them set the goals. You can let them set the objectives and you can make sure that it gets done by not necessarily jumping in and doing it for them, but letting them drive it, right? So that's four leadership styles, directing, coaching, supportive, and delegating. Well, ultimately, you want to get everyone over to the delegating quadrant, right? You want to get everybody you can over to the delegating quadrant. And when you get them at the delegating quadrant, you now have top performers, right? You've got top performers that know how to do their job and know how to do their job well. So on my live stream, Jeff, I'm showing this, uh, this, uh, this uh, four streams of leadership. I don't know if you can see my live stream, but I'm showing that right now on the live stream. But you ultimately want to take people from a directive leadership style over to a delegating leadership style because that means they now have the ability to do the task themselves. That's top performers. That's you. That's I. Right. We're top performers. We can do our job. We don't need to have someone telling us how to do things, when to do things. We can do them ourselves. We set our own goals. We set our own objectives. We set our own schedules. And we are able to go out and accomplish those things. So we've been in our task. We've been moved over to the delegate delegating quadrant of leadership style where we can do our stuff. But a lot of people don't. They start there and people fail because they just say, hey, go do this and get it done. They don't give them any competency. They don't do anything to build their commitment. They just say, hey, go do it. And that's where people fail. Or they're on the other side of the spectrum where they're just over directing. Right. That's your people that are the that are people that are just doing nothing but uh, hovering and micromanaging. Right. That loses people. So the, the, the Ken, Ken Blanchard situational leadership model is about situational leadership. Right. Different strokes for different folks. Right. Different strokes for different folks. So you got to recognize that as a leader.
And uh, oh, I lost you. Oh, there yeah, you go. Okay. And you get more bezel honey. And different more strokes for different folks. Different strokes for different folks. Situation, buddy. Nice, nice. Well, we're, we, uh, we have a kind of a short show today. Um, today was about leadership. We went over some attributes that provide good leadership. We talked about some personal stories that we learned to become leaders. Um, I can go all day on telling crazy stories on what my bosses tried to get me to do or, or uh, 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 did poorly. Uh, but I think the ones that stand out the most are the ones that made everybody feel like a family and that started a day with a group, started a day with a group um, where everybody kind of got to say something and instead of just standing there doing nothing, but start a day with, a, with like a group meeting and then have a goal and then whether, and sometimes every job's not going to let you to do that, but mainly just staying consistent and being there. And then you're going to realize you don't need them like what you're saying. You're, you're delegating, uh, they're delegating on their own and they're becoming their own leaders. And then they, in return, I guess, would have people underneath them. That's right. um, each job has a different way of doing it. Um, I think the most important thing to do is to learn is don't let your weaknesses or your, um, you know, uh, misfires uh, go on to them, meaning don't yell or get mad because that's your personality. That's going to, they're just going to put up a wall. I've done that many times and they're not going to do, they're not going to perform. You know, you want to give as clean, as safe, as, as, um, comfortable atmosphere for them to grow and do the thing that you have them there, do the job that you have them there to do and is best. And, and having the tools, I think that having the tools and the technology to help them achieve that task is big too. There's a lot of people that are saying, go figure it out, but they don't right. give you any tools. They don't right. give you any advice on how to get there. I think right there, that's, it's a setup for failure. And if you look at these big companies, um, a lot of them do that. It's like, why would you just set them up for failure and then wonder why it didn't work? It, uh, you know, these simple foundation attributes that we talk about aren't done. Mm -hmm. No, no they're often assumed. They're just assumed. They're assumed. And, and again, you, know, you have to go back to that situation where you talk about the fact that when I was a brand new supervisor, all I knew that I was supposed to do was hire people and fire people and boss them around, right? That's not leadership. So uh, how many people didn't get the same training that I was fortunate enough to get over the course of the last 30 some years? A lot, right? A lot. They're put in positions, but they're not prepared. And therefore, you, you've got a diminishing morale. You've got a, a, de a decline of the commitment level amongst employees. And therefore, it affects production. Lack and of revenue. It, yep, and hits revenue. Sales. Right. Yep. Sales, in a sales job, leadership is cruel. And you have the sales, and then you have the part doing the work. But man, it's it, it that that uh, commitment to stay positive is a big role. So, okay, today's show was about leadership. It was kind of a short one. Um, let us know what you think. Uh, hit thumbs up, subscribe. Um, apologize for just having to take my attention away. Hit thumbs up on the video. It'll be on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, condense the video on YouTube, and you can download it on podcast. If you have any comments, uh, if you would like to ask me or Steven any questions, uh, I'm a full-time real estate agent, a.k.a. Problem Solver, your personal realtor. Steven is my premier, a premier lender, uh, uh, the guy that gets it done every single time. That's why uh, I, I am committed uh, to help him as he's committed to help me. Steven, do you have anything uh, to say to finish the show off, sir? No, I just think the, uh, well, again, want to thank you for letting me come on and talk about a topic that is a lot of fun for me and um, different strokes for different folks, right? You can't manage everyone the same or expect to be managed the same. Different strokes for different folks. Everyone's different. We're all unique and we all require something a little bit different and taking the time to do it uh, leads to better morale, leads to better commitment, leads to better feelings and better production and things of that nature. So take some time and get to know the people that you're working with get to know what's important to them, and then cater things um, as needed to those people, right? More, you get more bees with honey, and give them. That's right, that's right.
throw some honey out there, you'll get more bees. Right. Uh, you can find me, Jeff, on Facebook, Steve for Home Loan, Steve Fennell for Home Loan. I'm also on the web at uh, www, the number 4ahome.loan, uh, the number 4ahome.loan. Uh, I also work for Fountain Mortgage, so you can go to fountainmortgage.com and find me there. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions about the topic as well. Yes, sir. Thank you. And your credentials and info will be in the link uh, in the bio of the video. Thank you, guys. It was great. I enjoy doing this. Next week, we have another guest coming. Uh, I have a couple guys lined up. I just want to make sure the one whoever confirms is the one that's going to get it, and I'll promote that. It's either going to be an appraiser or an inspector. Uh, appraisals get the worst rap of all, so I'm excited to talk to him and really find out how people uh, how people appraise and find out the price for a home. Thank you for listening. Jeff Osborne, Jeff of All Show, Jeff of All Trades, Jeff of All Trades Podcast. Thank you. Have a great day. Later. Thank you, Stephen.